Welcome to our learning community talk with uh, Dr. Pam Cantor, uh, who's the founder and uh, also the, currently the senior science advisor for Turnaround for Children. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Cantor will give us an overview of the research and ongoing efforts of Turnaround for Children um, to promote a whole child-centered approach to developing young people and share her truly deep knowledge around the role that schools and, and we as education advocates um, can and, and should play to support students and, and families contending um, both with the persistent inequities uh, uh, faced by uh, the public school population and also the trauma spurred and, and exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, I'll then uh, talk with Dr. Cantor after she gives us a brief presentation. Um, incorporating the questions uh, that you pose in the Zoom Q&A function. Um, so please uh, start populating that with your questions and I'll get to as many as possible in the half hour that we have together. Um, and of course, this is also a pitch for you to join live um, so that you, uh, you can pose your questions. Um, live. We are recording uh, today's session and, um, and we'll post it in Slack in the days to come. Um, also, uh, we have an upcoming uh, talk with the Kentucky Student Voice Team. Uh, that'll be on August 4th at 2 p.m. And registration information will be in your Slack channel. Um, we have some additional sessions that are not um, yet uh, scheduled, um, but are in discussion. So please share your ideas and your um, recommendations for folks who you would like to hear from. Uh, so. Now let me talk a little bit more about uh, Dr. Cantor and, and Turnaround for Children. Um, so uh, Turnaround for Children is an organization that works with educators from across the country um, to really embed an equitable whole child purpose into our education system. Um, and uh, over the past couple of years, have developed a broad range of materials and information for school leaders and for those of us who are school uh, adjacent uh, to consider in terms of how we truly create an equitable whole child centered approach to education. Uh, just by way of background, I wanted to note that I've been an admirer of Dr. Cantor's work um, for almost the, well, actually really the past two decades um, as uh, 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 when September 11th uh, happened in New York City um, at the uh, uh, New York City Public Schools, uh, we uh, uh, were in crisis. And uh, we recognized uh, that um, children in under our care face trauma. Um, we had considered really that those students whose caregivers, whose families had been uh, immediately affected, mostly uh, first responders um, were in trauma, as were those students who actually witnessed the towers fall. There were two public schools immediately adjacent to the World Trade Center. Um, so that was our primary consideration in, in terms of engaging Dr. Cantor and, and her team to provide services to, to trauma affected students and their families. Um, and what we learned through Dr. Cantor's work at that time was that there were really underlying uh, endemic trauma uh, that, that students and families face that from systemic inequities and from, from dealing with poverty. And so that there was broad-based trauma. It was not only those students who were directly immediately affected by September 11th. It was really the majority of our school population. And uh, from Dr. Cantor's work um, in the months uh, following September 11th, she saw the need uh, to address these inequities and to address trauma um, for school children across the country and founded Turnaround for Children. Um, so uh, we are honored to have her with us here today to share uh, the current work of Turnaround for Children and to provide some thoughts on how 
we can move forward together. Um, and uh, so she has a brief presentation, then she and I will talk, I will incorporate your questions. And uh, she has also agreed to stay on for overtime. Um, so we can have an informal discussion um, at the close of our formal uh, half hour uh, today. And um, I'll look forward to uh, having you join us um, for that as well. So with that, I will turn it over to, to Dr. Cantor. Thank you so much. And thanks to you and your team uh, for thinking to have me join you today. Um, I think that, that where I'd like to begin is building on that work in the 9-11 and post 9-11 era, because you made a reference to kids who had known trauma, but you also made a reference to what is important for all of us to know that supports learning for all children. And it was in that context in 2017 that we became one of the leaders of something called the Science of Learning and Development Alliance. And at that time, there were many diverse scientific theories being applied to education, some even competing with each other. But there was not a coherent way of bringing what we knew together to make them easily, let alone maximally useful to practitioners. So our group of partners began by producing a major synthesis taken from diverse scientific fields, where the idea was to answer the question, exactly what science should we pay attention to if our aim is to transform our current education into one that was equitable, one that developed the whole child, the learner, and what are the implications for practice? So this led to three academic papers published in the Journal of Applied Developmental Science. But still we knew even with that, that scientific discovery does not end when a paper is published. We also knew that even with these papers published, that academic papers don't necessarily lead to innovations, especially, especially innovations that seek to grapple with the implementation challenges that we know exist and the challenges of scale. How do we get an innovation to all kids? And with that are very, very typical and um, uh, stubborn systemic and policy barriers. So this is what led to the next phase of the work, the whole child design initiative. This was an initiative and a collaboration between Linda Darling Hammond and the Learning Policy Institute, us at Turnaround, and the Forum for Youth Investment. And surrounding us was a broad interdisciplinary group of advisors that we brought together. And this spring, we just launched the first of the two playbooks called Design Principles, Putting the Science of Learning and Development into Action. What we launched just now was a version that can be applied to schools, but there's another one, another playbook coming out a little bit later in the summer that is for learning settings that are not schools, because today we know learning happens everywhere. So I don't think we could have ever imagined a time where this kind of transformational change that is represented by this playbook could be more important. So when we think about students returning to school in the fall, we know that there's going to be a great variation in what we see because of the unique experiences of lockdown and the racialized violence that we have all been witness to. But there are also assumptions and dominant narratives about the challenges we face in students coming back to classrooms. You hear about the trauma of COVID the impact of racialized violence and historic inequities in educational opportunity. You hear about the problem of learning loss and lost instructional time. And then there are the beliefs that young people have about whether they and their identities and cultures will be welcomed into their learning communities and the fears they have about their futures. And then just how many of our students, particularly those most vulnerable, will internalize these messages about difference 
as damage or loss as personal failure, a narrative which runs counter to everything we know from developmental and learning science. So the situation begs the question, are we looking at different problems or are we looking at different faces of the same problem? That variation, promise, individuality are the essence of human development and learning science and the way we all become learners. But the approaches we've taken thus far to learning in schools have not fully challenged our assumptions about learning. Is it highly variable or does it fall into a bell curve? Or intelligence, is it defined by our genes or by the context that drives their expression? Should we continue to offer menus of labels and interventions or conceive of a bolder response that reflects a new equitable purpose for education and learning settings, one that is encompassing, relationship rich, holistic, rigorous, and profoundly positive and engaging of students' interests and capabilities. Today, we know that it is context, the environments, experiences, and relationships that we are exposed to that drive the development of our brains, how we learn, and even the expression of our genes. What would it mean if all of the places where children are growing and learning were designed to know each child, the whole child, and meet them where they are, understanding the context in which they are growing up and help each and every one develop to their fullest potential? What would that look like? Under the right conditions, imagine what any child would be capable of because this is what we're gonna be talking about today. The developmental and learning science paint an optimistic picture about what is possible for each and every child. Developmental and learning science tells us that if we optimize the design of context, we optimize the possibility that our young people will not only catch up and recover from the effects of this year, but we will have created a big down payment on the learning settings we need to build for ours and their future. But everything depends on what we decide to invest in. We've done it for some children, mostly middle-class and affluent children, kids who will have a much easier time surmounting the effects of this year, but we have not done it for all children and we especially have not done it for students of color and students from low-income communities. This is the opportunity we have now and the inflection point we are in. And this is a time where we get to decide because there is a huge financial investment going on right at this moment in children's learning and their futures. Education has long been central to the promise of America, yet our 20th century system was never designed to develop the learner and it was never designed for equity. But today in the 21st century, we know that the insights from brain and learning science align profoundly with what so many parents know about their kids and want for their kids. And what so many teachers have been saying for years that we can create learning environments and a system that recognizes children as whole individual people sees and values their assets. The message in the science is clear. We need a new design mapped to the way the brain grows and children learn, a design that combines positive developmental relationships, environments filled with safety and belonging, rich, meaningful learning experiences where students discover what they're capable of, the intentional development of the critical skills, habits, and mindsets that all successful learners have and integrated student supports. On relationships, that relationships are important is not new knowledge. Relationships engage children in ways that help them define who they are, help them be willing to take academic risks and discover what they can become and see how and why they are important to other people. 
for safety and belonging in virtually every study of positive youth development, there's always one finding right at the top. Children will struggle to engage and learn when they don't feel physically, emotionally, and identity safe, when they don't feel like they and their culture are represented and valued in their learning community. These types of practices can be built into the design of schools from the outset that affirm the culture and cultural diversity of all of a school student. When we say rich learning experiences, we are speaking of the kinds of personalized instructional experiences that fully engage and challenge us, that build our confidence and where we discover what we're capable of. And we know that students learn best when they can be engaged working and problem solving with their peers. So when we speak of skills, habits, and mindsets, well, we know from learning science that learning is an integrated process. There is not a math part of the brain separate from a creative part of the brain. These parts of the brain are all anatomically cross-wired and functionally integrated. We're talking about skills like self-regulation, executive functions, social skills, growth mindset, resilience, and perseverance. These are skills that are essential 21st century skills for success in learning, but also work and life. And finally, of course, integrated supports. All learning environments need to be set up with many more protective factors in place, including and especially health and mental health, but integrated supports also include opportunities during and beyond the school day to balance academics with more opportunities to know children, their backgrounds, and to nurture their interests and passions. This kind of support will tip the balance toward an environment where students feel safe, included, motivated, and engaged. But bringing this kind of skill development to life in a learning setting means settings designed for relationships and teamwork. Adults trained to know how the brain grows and how learning happens and integrated tools that make it easier for teachers and practitioners to teach rigorous content and develop the skills of a curious, self-directed learner at the very same time. But here's the secret sauce. The development of a whole child emerges when we combine these elements into experiences that connect to one another. And if you wanna picture this, picture a web, a web of experiences, because this is how our brains actually develop. Lots of connections that happen between brain structures, and it is these connections that produce for us increasingly complex skills. Oh, thank you, uh, Dr. Cantor, for those remarks. I just want to note to the audience, we'll be uh, uh, sharing the information on the design principles and uh, the other resources you noted in our, um, in our Slack channel. Um, I have a few questions. And again, uh, for the audience, please put your questions in the Q&A function and, um, and, we will, and I will get to them. Uh, so uh, you'd mentioned uh, innovation um, and, and how people are approaching this work in a new way now. Uh, and I just wanted to see if at this point there are any preliminary bright spots where you've seen uh, people taking advantage of, of the information provided by the design principles to shift approach or to prepare for uh, the fall in terms of um, providing services for students. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we wanted to accomplish in the playbook was actually for someone to look at it and say, hey, this kind of practice is already happening. There are places that are doing this fully fleshed out integrated work, not just in individual schools, in networks of schools, expeditionary learning, EL education, Highline schools, big picture learning. These are all places where taking these five elements 
and combining them into integrated, personalized, culturally affirming experiences for kids is actually going on. So we know that it's possible to do, and we know that it's possible to do where the population of kids is highly diverse. But even these networks, which at the most would be 200 schools, that's about the kind of scale that we've gotten to. To, to take the next leap where you say, well, wait a second, every child in America should have an opportunity to go to a school like that and have relationships that support their development, that know who they are and what they can be. This is what we haven't done. I would say the innovation part exists, but the innovation at scale part is still very much the hurdle that we have to climb. Just to follow up on, uh, on those examples, could you drill down a little bit in just terms of anecdotes? Like what are some of the changes in approach that you've seen from these, uh, I was going to say, so from these schools, um, just as, uh, as, a, as a means of sort of being able to envision what the shift in approach should look like? So what is common to every one of the examples that we cite was a decision that got made to put relationships to kids and relationships in the adult community at the center of the school design. So we think about what that means. You know, you don't have any more this, oh, well, there are 35 kids in my classroom. Do you expect me to have a relationship with all of them? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. We expect you to have a relationship with all of them, but what can we do in the design of the school to make that actually possible? So there are structures, some people call them advisories, some people call them circles, some people call them clubs, but creating greater intimacy of connection for teachers with kids and for kids with each other gets structured. Then you have the issue of time and the schedule, the thing that's always said, well, I don't have time to do that. Okay, I'm gonna be judged on whether my kids have high standardized test scores. So I can't dedicate time in the day for things like this. The answer is yes, you can. And, and there are places which make that decision because what they know is that the fuel for the kind of engagement and effort and learning that we want only happens when you create space like this. And then there's the issue of rigor of, um, well, wait a second, you talk about relationships and social skills and things like this. Then there's that false choice question that I always get, which is, well, is the priority relationships and social skills and 21st century skills or is the priority rigorous academic work? And a crazy false choice because nobody when you think about why parents who can afford to, what they will look for in schools, they're not gonna say, oh, well, I want one or the other. They're gonna say, oh, I want both for my kids. I want them to develop the skills for success in life. And I want them to be able to do rigorous academic work. So what I've just said to you around prioritization of relationships, challenging the school schedule that defeats that kind of connection and intimacy, not having false choices between academic work and the other skills we know that kids need. These are the features of all of the innovative schools that, that I would tell you about. They all built this in and made the commitment to that. Picking up on, on that, what optimally is the role of school employees of, of school affiliated adults? And what is the role of child affiliated individuals, guardians, caregivers, parents, families? Um, 
how should how should those two communities intersect? How should they approach this in behalf of students? So, so this this is a really important question because 20th century schooling was as if the only important adults were the pedagogical adults. And parents were supposed to turn their kids over to this structure called school and let the school as the expert take care of what needed to be taken care of. Today, we know that if you were hypothetically to put the kind of knowledge I've been talking about of science of learning and development into the hands of every single adult that touches the life of a child, if we had a common language for development, a common language for how learning happens, and everybody knew they had a role in that. Think about the power of that, both inside traditional school settings and outside. Personally, I've also been very influenced by an organization called the Forum for Youth Investment, the work of Karen Pittman. And Karen Pittman's organization has been trying for years to soften the walls between the parent community and the school community, the community-based organizations and after school, health and mental health. So right now, I think there is an incredible opportunity because, because schools are really feeling they can't do this by themselves. They just can't. They need the parents to be with them. They need health and mental health to be with them. And everybody needs to be in a joined developmental enterprise, both for recovery, but also for the future design for schools. I'll tell you one other thing that we, you and I were talking about the state of Ohio. And there was a panel I was on, I think I mentioned to you with Leanne Cornyn, and she was explaining to me about the opioid crisis in mm -hmm. Ohio and that the opioid crisis has created tremendous bridging between different systems into a kind of much more integrated way of operating. And she said, one of the things that she used to hear all the time when she would give a talk is, I hope if we solve the op opioid crisis that we never go back to the isolated silos that we used to have. So right now we have another opportunity to build that kind of integrated enterprise and we must. So I have two closing questions. So picking up on uh, the, the theme of an opportunity mindset. Uh, and uh, we had a, a prior uh, presenter uh, talk about, we need to take advantage of the incredible resource that the federal government is providing around education funding um, and not miss the opportunity for this to become an embedded element of how we support um, our communities. And we were talking uh, recently with a, a member of the San Francisco Unified School Board, School District School Board. Um, so the need is so great that even with this influx of resources, uh, we're not going to meet uh, the, the overwhelming needs of our students. So given that context, uh, if you look into the future, um, what are the things that you would recommend based on the relief funding and just on, on general practice um, in what systems need to look at, what school sites, what school systems, what state education agencies should prioritize to create that new framework? Mm -hmm. So a lot, of the, <clears throat> a lot of the material that you're hearing me talk about are optimizing conditions for learning that are drawn from the scientific science of learning and development. But then there's the core. And the core of learning is asking us to look at whether the way we deliver instruction is optimized for students. And what we really find is that it's very, very difficult for most education practitioners to deal with the reality 
of how much variation in learning is the norm. I'm not talking about kids with learning disabilities, which is a phrase I have a struggle with anyway. But learning is not a bell curve. Learning is enormous variation, which we are not designed for. But we now live in an age where technology could be our friend. Technology is something that is designed for variation. Okay, it doesn't struggle with variation. So technological tools, if well-designed and situated in a context where we are still prioritizing what humans can do that only humans can do. Okay, humans in relationship build belief, confidence, I can, I will, all of that comes from the human side of learning. But the content side of learning that deals with the variation in how students learn, adaptive technologies are extraordinary for that. So why don't we combine these things? Why do we think that a teacher should do it all? And I think today, this, this idea, I mean, I, I did a very interesting presentation invited to imagine ed tech for whole child. And, and there are places I would refer your, um, your audience to the Cajon Valley School District right outside of San Diego. It's an incredible example of preparing every adult for whole child work, not just in the classroom, use of technology, a commitment to all of the whole child principles I just said, and seeing kids who are flourishing even with a highly, highly, highly diverse student population. So I, I think that if we decide to combine the things that we know, then we are going to be able to respond to many, many more kids and their needs. So your, yours was a question about resources. And the way I look at the resources that are available now, I am worried that they're gonna be spent on old things mm -hmm. and not on the things that we know, or that they will plug gaps in budgets. But if there is a subset of districts across the country that say, we are gonna establish the foundations for whole child work, and we will continue to build on that foundation in the years to come, that foundational work is where I would put the ARPA money today. You're preaching to the choir here. I suspected uh, as much. <laughs> And closing question, uh, who's been someone who influenced you and, and why is that? Okay. Um, well, based on the comments I've made, I'll give you, I'll give you two people. Um, the academic mentor I would talk to you about is um, Todd Rose and Richard Lerner because they are human development people who taught me a lot about the ways in which children develop and grow as individuals. I knew that from my practice as a psychiatrist, but I didn't know that this was a principle that should be foundational to how schools operate. So individual development, it would be Richard Lerner and Todd Rose. In the, in the systems work, I would say the person who's had the biggest influence on me is Jim Shelton, who I met when he was deputy secretary in the Obama years. And Jim always looks at innovation through one lens, and that is how to get it to all kids. So I continue to learn from him on the hurdles of scale. On that note, thank you. Uh for giving us your time uh, this afternoon, Dr. Cantor.